So Father, grant that our minds may be filled by you and filled with you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So both our readings today have a special place in my heart. The verses from Philippians were what I chose to write out and give to each of my boys when the time came for them to fly the nest and go out into the world and make their own way. It seemed the best advice that I could give them. And the gospel reading always makes me smile because the last words, for many are called, but few are chosen, remind me of going to a little weekday service of Holy Communion with my old mum down in our hometown of Chertsey. And it was a chilly morning and the heating hadn't really been up to scratch and at the end of the service quite a few of the old folk were complaining. But the church warden, who was a lovely man, came up and said, Don't worry my friends, for many are cold but few are frozen. So I shall pause here while you quietly groan, especially if you've heard me tell that tale before. It's an important verse. Many are called, but few are chosen. The good news has it, many are invited, but few are chosen. And this parable is all about God's invitation to us. His loving, welcoming grace. His offer to us to live in his presence and enjoy the good things that he has prepared for us. The parable is about God's sorrow and anger when we decline his gracious invitation. When we decide that we really haven't got time for all this God stuff or we think that we can manage without, thank you, because we have better, rather more important things to do. And it's not that these are bad things in themselves, but so often, as William Barclay puts it, we, we hear the claims of this world so insistently that the soft invitation of the voice of Christ cannot be heard. And that breaks God's heart because he knows what we need. And over and over again, he sees us turning our back on what is good and right for us. He watches us with a mixture of sorrow and anger as we are so busy making a living that we fail to make a life. And we can be so busy with the administration and organisation of life that we forget life itself. We're so busy with second bests that we actually miss out on the very best. And so the parable reminds us that we have a choice. The offer of God's grace of life lived with him as king, that offer is always there, an open invitation to us. But we have to choose to accept that invitation. And when we do accept, the parable shows us that this comes with responsibility. God grants us the free will to choose to follow him or not. He will never force us. But once we have committed our way to him and accepted his love and grace, then things will change. Things must change. We have to be willing to be changed, as that great hymn puts it, from changed from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place. God loves us as we are, all of us, yes. That's what Jesus came to show us. But God also sees us as we could be, as he always intended us to be. He loves us too much to leave us just as we are. And by his grace, he transforms us evermore into his likeness. He longs to make us to be more like Jesus. And for that to happen, we have to be willing to bring him our whole selves and to offer him our very best. 
Once we have accepted the invitation to God's feast, we need to prepare ourselves accordingly. This is not cheap grace. It is not to be taken for granted. We can't say, oh, thanks God, that's decent of you. Yes, I'll come and enjoy your feast, but on my own terms. We can't just turn up in our rough old clothes. We can't just give God the fag end of our day or a bit of attention on a Sunday morning. We must be willing to be changed by the complete renewing of our mind, as Anne spoke about the other week. And so the wedding clothes that God expects us to wear have nothing to do with a fashion parade, of course, but they stand for the spirit, the inner clothes of our soul, of our heart and of our mind. The garment of expectation, the garment of humble penitence, the garment of faith and the garment of reverence. These are the garments that we need to put on as we approach God. We need to prepare ourselves to think about what we are doing as we come to worship and to offer God our very best. After all, you wouldn't go to a wedding wearing your old gardening clothes. You get dressed up. You put on your finest, finest clothes, not because you want to make a big show, but out of respect and affection for the couple getting married. You want to show them that they are special to you. As we accept God's loving invitation to receive his life in us, we need to put on the inner clothing that will honour him. And this is our choice. God never forces us, but he always hopes. And this idea of choice leads me into our reading from Philippians. Now, I've been following a course by Mercy UK called Keys to Freedom. And in the sessions of last week, I was struck by this story. And I quote, with permission. Arianna Walker, the CEO of Mercy UK, tells of a dream she had during a difficult time in her life. It helped her to understand the importance of being responsible for what goes on inside our own minds, instead of assuming that God will just do it all for us. In the dream, she saw herself sitting at a large round table, dining table in a restaurant, and around the table were her guests, faith, hope, love, joy, peace, strength and wisdom. They chatted, laughed and sang together like the good friends they were. The scene was one of joy, fellowship and friendship. As Arianna watched the scene in her dream, she became aware of three figures stood over in the shadows. Wondering who they were, she felt the Spirit of God tell her that they were her enemies. Fear, worry and unbelief. These enemies stared at her with such hatred that it sent a cold ripple through her body. And she asked God, why are they here? They don't belong in this place. And God answered, this restaurant, like your life, is open to the public. Life on earth is an open space that can sometimes be visited by enemies. But who sits at your table is by invitation only. And even in her dream, the truth of that statement hit her like a ton of bricks. As she continued to observe the scene, she saw herself become distracted by these figures near the bar. Each time she would steal a glance in their direction or cease the conversation with her companions, she could see them move towards her. Finally, fear stood 
directly behind the seat of faith. And the entire scene stood still. Everyone went quiet. The tension was palpable in the air as both fear and faith looked her directly in the eyes. And then she heard the voice of God. There are no more seats at your table and faith will not share a seat with fear. Choose your companions wisely. Ariana woke up and realised the battles she faced would be won or lost in her mind and in her thoughts. Our external world will always be open to the presence of our enemies. But what goes on inside our heads, our thoughts and our beliefs, that is within our area of responsibility to manage and to direct. God will help us if we ask him, but he will not usurp our authority. He will not brainwash us. It's important to realise that we do not have to think about whatever pops into our heads. Thoughts will come to us uninvited and we cannot always control what thoughts land in our heads, but we can choose which thoughts we ponder on, which thoughts we allow to sit at our table, as it were. You have control over what you think about. Just as we exercise control over our bodies and how we behave, God expects us to exercise control over our minds and what we think. We choose what thoughts we agree with in the same way that we choose to forgive or we choose to, to say yes to Christ. It takes our will to say yes, and then our actions must support that choice. We accept the invitation to God's wedding feast, and then we dress ourselves accordingly. The Holy Spirit gives us divine encouragement and empowerment to think the right kind of thoughts, his thoughts, not Hours. And surely this is what St Paul is talking about when he says to us, And now, my friends, all that is true, all that is noble, all that is just and pure, all that is lovable and attractive, whatever is excellent and admirable, fill your thoughts with these things. It is said that we are what we eat, that the food we put into our body determines what our body becomes. In the same way, we become what we think. What we feed our minds and our hearts on determines who we become. And God wants us to become like Jesus. So to use a good Yorkshire expression, think on. Amen.